So these are our regular webinar series on LinkedIn. And my name is Aina Elayev. If you joined the series the first time, I am an agile and enterprise coach and uh, founder of Be Agile Tutoring. So what I do is uh, coaching enterprises and being more like agile and modernized and up to date and also provide some trainings regarding agile and project manager management outside of my contract work. And Danish is my colleague and Agile Transformation Coach as well. So Danish, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Aina. So wouldn't bore you with all those jargons of transformation and also because Danish Kumar has been an agilist for a decade and a half now and working with the top tier MNCs as well as some smaller organization along the course and continue to learn Go learn and make changes, meaningful changes into the lives of people who we work. Thank you, Danish. And uh, just for your awareness, this session is uh, recorded, uh, but uh, when I am going to uh, post it on YouTube and other social media, I will cut off uh, the beginning and uh, like probably QA at the end and uh, keep just lecture to make sure that people are coming to our live webinars as well to ask questions and collaborate. So let's get started. And today we are talking about uh, scaled agile and uh, why it's um, important uh, to know about scaled agile. So first of all, I think all of you know what Scrum is, what agile is, like Kanban, this basic jargon. But if you don't, so agile is um, a new, methodology and uh, way of work for large enterprises which have been around for like 20 years and coming after waterfall which was too uh, uh, bureaucratic and um, straightforward and also like waterfall still makes sense for some organizations and um, some enterprises and way of work but in agile it makes sense to work when you want to gather the feedback from the customers as soon as possible. And instead of building the product from the beginning and the end and try selling and then appear that nobody needs the product or someone already delivered what you're trying to build, we gather feedback and implement it on the earliest stages. And um, that's why the world is leaning to Agile right now. And Scrum is one of the frameworks such as uh, Kanban. And SAFE is kind of like Scrum of Scrums, the framework for larger enterprises when there are many different business units and departments which need to align with uh, each other. And so it's kind of like SAFE provides some like scaled way of work and structure for organizations who've been around like in the business for a while and um, have large structure and need to figure out how can they manage the changes. And Dinesh, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, so one thing which uh, Aina has already covered out the Agile part, and we are going to talk more about the scaling Agile and uh, doing scaled Agile implementations. But uh, just to give a, one quick info here, we will be sharing the slide deck uh, in a PDF format with you, so you can you can continue to focus on and make notes, whatever you want to make. But in terms of looking into slides and all, you will get a copy of this uh, uh, post uh, webinar. Thank you, Danish. So let's continue the slides. And uh, also the purpose of today is uh, to get uh, collaboration and communication as much as possible, not just uh, provide the lecture. So slides are kind of just like support for what we are going to talk about today. And yes, yeah, so there is a quote of Nick Erstian, so those who master large-scale software delivery will define the economic landscape of the 21st century. And why he says it, again, because we provide products which nobody else built before because business developed and technology developed. So we need to be agile and flexible and be adaptive to changes. And that's why large-scale software delivery will define our future and basically not future, but the current stage of life. Well, let's move on to the next one. Mm, yep, yeah. and which is we are going to talk about the technological revolutions here. So 
currently we are in the digital age, but as you can see, uh, we, we have been through multiple uh, revolutions and that has defined those eras. And currently we are in an era of software and digital that get started in 70s and turning point was 2000s, uh, early in the turn of the century. And then it continues to go on and let's see how long we continue to stay in this uh, era of uh, digital that is going to be defining the ways we work, defining the way how we communicate, collaborate, and deliver things. There, there are massive trends that are happening in terms of uh, AI, ML, and whatnot. So suddenly there are going to be much and more uh, evolutionary things that will take shape and will take us to a maturity period. And then we will probably be ready for another uh, uh, revolution, but that's probably ahead of us uh, at least a couple of decades from now. But who knows? Who knows? Yeah, 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 you never know. Yeah, it could be the next decade itself. That is so true. So, as, as we can see, uh, we, we have been through these different ones. There has been installation period, turning points, and deployment period. Wouldn't bore you with deeper details in here, and we'll get to uh, where we what stage we are in. So as we can see, like uh, uh, there, there are big organizations and organizations, manufacturing organizations, traditional organizations, they are transitioning themselves uh, and looking into getting into more digital connect and working with the customers on a digital platform so that they can do different work. And they are expecting their revenues dynamics to be changing uh, from, from traditional to more digital way and uh, improving their uh, market cap, improving their value ratios. And this is all information coming directly from organizations. Nothing has been uh, added by or uh, given by the skilled agile or from our end. So it's all true representation of the market and how things are going in the market. So another quote from competing from Mick Christian on uh, competing in the age of software. Problem is not with our organization realizing that they need to transform. The problem is that organizations are using managerial frameworks and infrastructure models from past revolutions to manage their businesses in this one. While we are in a different age of revolution, which is not exactly the same what was happening earlier. Hence, we have to change the mindset. We have to change the way we work together. We have to change the way we organize ourselves in order to deliver value to the end user or our customer. Customer centricity has taken to the all new levels in, in this digital era and bringing all traditional as well as digital assets to the fore and bringing that amalgamation of value delivery to, to deliver the value to our end user. And this means that we have to change fundamentals of how we operate and we are going to be uh, learning about it uh, more. Uh, Aina, would you like to add something more here? Yeah, I do. This is actually my favorite topic and I can speak for an hour <laughs> about um, organization. Let's not do that. You will not give any time to our uh, attendees yeah. to otherwise. <laughs> yeah, so I'll try to be short. So. Yeah, nowadays organizations already understand that they need to transform and uh, that's why there is high demand on agile coaches and scrum masters and uh, like recruiters are like contacting me almost like every day and uh, asking if I'm available to help the organization. So this shows that people understand like leaders in the organizations understand that we need to transform. What we do doesn't work as well as we want, so we need to do something. But the problem is they don't really understand what they need to change. And when they hire agile coaches or other consultants and specialists, uh, they don't understand that the problem is that they use managerial frameworks from the past revolutions because they think like their way of work is good enough, so probably the teams are not delivering, so we, we need uh, to work with people, we need to restructure the teams, but no, the problem is deeper than just make the teams deliver faster. The problem is in this managerial frameworks, which need to change, but to change the frameworks like within the whole organization, it's 
kind of like changing, I, I don't know, like the blood system of the body, which is very challenging. I can't say it's impossible, but it's challenging and it takes away more time and effort that many leaders expect. And I believe this is one of the biggest challenge of the transformations nowadays. Back to you, Absolutely, you, you nailed it. So the biggest challenge is the pain it causes and a version of that pain that leaders look for, they don't want to go through the pains of doing the changes, which are going to be really revolutionary. Hence, transformations does not really take the shape and form as they should and get remain in stuck in those past mindset of managerial pain. Uh, Tom, I believe you had some question there. Yes, yeah, so, so would we be having a Q&A later or can I ask some questions now? Oh, you, 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 you can always ask question in the meantime. We will have a, a Q and A in the later part also. But if you have a question, that goes yes, so, so I think you, we'll be happy you, to take it. Yeah, you touched on this. Uh, you know the the pain points, right? When you try to make a change. So, so my question is: Are we in as we talk? Are we going to kind of touch on any recommended way to do this thing? Because change is not easy, and and and. Again, uh, having again, I have worked with agile teams. I have tried to put in agile systems or agile processes, and to me, it takes like eighteen months at least before somebody sees some some something or you change a habit, right? So, are we going to talk on some of those how to do things uh, as we talk through, or no? Ah, uh, so there are certainly some nuggets there. I will not say that everything will be covered in correct, the correct. present town uh, and. Uh, and I and I were discussing to have follow-up sessions to have more deeper dive on to those how part because today's session is more to introduce our attention okay. to scale design. And they're certainly going to be ways how we are going to be doing it. But does it get to the real practical aspects of de dealing with different change management aspect, people management aspect? And as, as you have said, having that understanding that any change does take time to stick. And as you have rightly said, it takes about 18 months, you have said, and I would say, yeah, for any change to be really visible in a true transformation thing, it takes about anywhere between 12 to 18 months to truly realize that some things are working, some things are not working, and then mm -hmm. you can further tweak those and get to the next level. Okay, sure. I mean, I, we can always talk offline, but yeah, thank you for, for, for the response. Most welcome. Yep. So... Yep. Let's continue the flow, uh, Aina. Yes, so another quote from uh, John uh, Cotter, and if you don't know this person, I'm a big fan of him and uh, follow him on so social media and read uh, the books and information he provides. So he's kind of like my virtual mentor without knowing that he's mentoring me. So the quote from him is rethinking the organization. So the, word, uh, the world is now changing at a rate at which the basic system structures and uh, cultures built over the past century cannot keep up with the demands uh, being placed on them. And I totally agree with this because what worked in the past, it's not bad. It worked, but since the world is changing, we need to rethink what's been working in the past and maybe adapt some parts of this, but uh, also we need to understand that it cannot keep up with the demands what is happening nowadays. Yeah, and uh, one thing to be add here is uh, he, there is a new book from uh, John Carter, Accelerate, Building a Strategic Agility for a Faster Moving World. Uh, talks about a lot of things in terms of how uh, those rigid systems that have been created in past revolutions are uh, built around those inflexible hierarchies are becoming modern challenges for us to overcome. It's a wonderful read. So if you want to have a uh, quick note on what, what to read in terms of if you're planning to do some, some uh, transformation in your organization. And I know, Tom, specifically, you are interested in doing it something in your Organization Accelerate Building Strategic Agility is the book you certainly want to have a read to. Okay, thank you. So in Accelerate, he, he has uh, illustrated that successful enterprises don't start as large and cumbersome. Uh, they, they typically uh, are a fast-moving adaptive network of motivated individuals. So not, not, 
the moment we talk about any change, change is not referring, referring to the processes, change is not referring to the processes or tools or techniques, but change refers to the individuals or people. And that's where I say, the moment if you want to say transformation, if you are trying to do transformation based on tools and processes, I'm sorry to say, that is not going to stick, that is not going to be successful, unless you first focus on people. Tools, processes are aid there to catalyze that transformation, but primary focus has to be on the people, individuals who are going to be uh, coming together for a common vision that is aligned and focused on our customers. Roles and reporting structures needs to be fluid, not, not carved out in a stone, but it has to be fluid and based on how they are organizing themselves around value for our customer is going to be the key. Yes, and we are not meaning that uh, tools and processes and documentation is not important. I know like many teams new to Agile try to fight me with my own words when they don't want to document anything or like keep saying like people are important and everything else is not like no tools are important documentation is important but we need to make common sense of all of this but focusing on people first which doesn't mean that everything else is not important i just want to make sure that everybody's clear on that yeah, yeah but, but, but i think if i may i think what you're basically trying to say is the mindset you need to change the way people think that's what i think is is, is what you're trying to Oh, absolutely, Tom. Yes. So mindset is the way to lead the thing. So if you are if you are not able to change the mindset of the people, first, the change has to be come within from the leadership itself. And they, they need to demonstrate that, right? So it, it goes back to the very basics of leadership, leadership by example, right? So if you cannot set the example of dealing in a flexible mindset with a growth mindset, so there are two types of mindset, fixed and growth. You have to demonstrate that growth mindset over and over again to the people so that they can start to see those changes and take that lead and start transforming themselves. Thank you. Right. So let's, let's just uh, move faster because we are 22 minutes in. So let's just look at this. What, what do you see? What, what's happening in here? We have a solid structure in the background, but we are seeing all this bubble all over here. What's what's happening in here is basically that rigid structure that we have in our organization that is focused on. And, and let me ask that question. And uh, uh, anyone, anyone can answer or type in their answers. What exactly are today's modern organization are looking for? What's their primary objective? What they look for? Just one thing, if you can pinpoint, what is that an organization are looking for? What their focus has become in, in recent entrepreneurial or bigger organizations? Any any inputs? Let me see in chat. And product? Success. Revenue, okay, yeah. Success, sustainability, all right. Value. Value. Speed to market. Ah, those are those are the things that we are we are trying to do from, from the perspective of agility. But what exactly uh, we are trying to do from the perspective of uh, organization? Organizations are becoming okay. in conflict of whether they maximize the value or stakeholder payouts, dollar values, or focus on the customer and, and things are changing. Things are changing because they have realized that they have to suddenly embrace, like as Srida said, embracing change, timely delivery, flexible organization. Yeah, they are starting to do that. But if you look at our rigid structures that's been across the uh, enterprises across the globe, their focus has been maximizing the stakeholder value. Dollars, how do you do that? Profitability. In, in organizations, you will find there, there will be profit centers and each profit center will have a mandate to maximize the profit and not optimize it. And there is a subtle difference between maximization and optimization. And that has to be understood. So we certainly need to do a lot of work in terms of the mindset changes. We have to do certainly a lot of work in terms of 
be becoming uh, organizations not to collide and create this mess from customer perspective because customer is getting lost in this whole transition. Hmm. And another quote on yeah. this from again John Cotter is uh, the solution is not to trash what we know and start over, but instead to reintroduce a second system, one which would be familiar to most successful entrepreneurs. And it aligns to what I said like previously. We used waterfall, and it doesn't mean that waterfall is bad. Let's forget waterfall, cancel waterfall. No, we can still study it first and examine and see what we can take from it, but also understand that what worked in the past might not be working in the future. So instead, we need to introduce a second system. Absolutely, and you, you touched upon a very good point. Waterfall works as well. Like some say, oh, uh, nothing should be done in waterfall. No, that's not true either. And as you uh, touched upon, if you, if you know your requirements are predictable, you what you know you are going to be delivering is pretty scoped out. There is no need to go and do experiment with agile on that. Because agile is typically from from your uh, uncertainty where it's uncertainty where is the chaos is there so agile is most adaptable to the places where it's not a very stable environment not a stable requirement and as i used to say uh, in my sessions with the people and it's a kind of anecdote you can walk over uh, water or requirements if they are frozen so, right so you you cannot walk on a water with, without it being frozen same way requirement if those are frozen yeah you can go ahead and do it with waterfall but if it is not the moment you have flex uh, uh, uncertainty out there agile is your way to do to get your faster feedback your loop feedback loops are smaller you, 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 your turnaround time is going to be quicker and you will provide the consumer or customer what they need. And that's why we call customer centricity as our primary thing to be done with a dual operating system as what they call. There is a hierarchy that is there, but you create an operating system organized around value the value delivery you, you do your value stream and and you you understand how you are going, how you are delivering value your your that hierarchy can stay in their organizational hierarchy that we have built over last 50 60 100 years will remain those are time tested structure but they are going to be more from the perspective of your recruitment cycles or retentions or uh, something of more that but when it comes to the delivery of the value or the delivery mechanism, that's where you create that dual or second operating system as Ayana mentioned about having a second system in place to deliver value. And this is how it will look like. So, oops, I skipped one side, yeah. Yeah, so this is a scary slide of safe. <laughs> you see it the first time, it might look very unclear, but actually we will move on to the slides and explain business agility in more details just in a few minutes. So Dean Leffingwell, who is the creator of SAFE and uh, uh, it was like my good fortune. I've been uh, had a couple of meetings with Dean as part of our safe summits and uh, uh, good interaction with him. He he always says uh, that be it safe or be it any other methodology, it's only as good or as bad as we implement it. And from from his perspective. Uh, and and we can, we will see that there is a lot of bashing around safe happening on on media. Like so, his his viewpoint is, if you are getting successful, people are going to say something about you. You should focus on how you can create and deliver value because in today's environment where everything is software business now, no matter what you are doing, you need to have your digital presence. You need to have a means to connect with your consumers digitally, irrespective of what services or products you are providing, be it in banking, insurance, automotive, groceries, even your uh, 
commute everywhere. You need to have your digital presence and become, hence, every business, each and every business is becoming a software business. Hence, business agility comes into the field. Oh, there was somebody saying cannot hear. Yes, and we also. Looks, looks like some folks cannot, but I think I can hear you guys clearly. Okay, maybe some specific problems from their end, or I can speak with a little bit louder also. Yeah, let's increase our whole. Actually, there is one question there, I think uh, Niket was asking, uh, Dinesh. So I think his question is, if we are saying waterfall is a way to go, then why are banks pushing for agile compliance projects as well? Because banks are supposed to be, I think, uh, more stoic in that approach. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. So that's a very good question, Nikit. And uh, there could be certain aspects of uh, even compliance related things that could have some uncertainty with how you go about it, how you implement it. Hence, they want to test and learn because if you implement a system to, to adhere to the different requirements from your audit perspective, your budgetary perspective, or your government compliance perspective, and you implement one system by keeping okay one state in mind and you wait for six months or nine months to deliver that system, in the meantime, uh, some tweaks may come in or the, the way you have decided to implement it is not really fully compliant with the system. So this is where your test and learn approach comes into the play from a that perspective. Do you really need to have every two week delivery or every week delivery for that? That's where I would say, that's where things go wrong because not everything becomes a package to deliver value to our customer within a day or week or two weeks because some things has to come as a package together to make sense of uh, what the deliverable is and create value for our users. Hence, blind implementation, oh no, everybody is going to do one week sprint, everybody is going to do two week sprint, deliver every sprint. No, that's where things go wrong. Not, see, Agile is not, if you really, I think uh, Aina touched upon this part and she said, applying common sense. And uh, I, I get into trouble with my fellow coaches on this, but I always say, Agile is nothing but structured common sense. You, you pick any aspect of the value or principles that is there in the manifesto and tell me what does not make sense if you really want to do things right. Everything there is a common sense. So, people have to apply some common sense while adopting agility and each and every area could be different. Each and every team could be different and there could be a different uh, learning curve for each of the teams to adapt to agility. Like one team could adapt to the agility in a three months time frame, but other team could take nine months to adapt to that based on complexity of their systems or complexity of their connected systems or complexity of overall environment, complexity of how the business is being run and things could be different. So we cannot have the same yardstick for each team or each area of operation that takes place in any business. So we certainly need to be pragmatic in that and that goes with the name of uh, my business, which I call pragmatic agility or, or fragility in sort. So. <laughs> All right, I hope I answered your question, Naked, and uh, happy to chat with you in more details one on one. Also, feel free to connect and send a note, and happy to set up something. Yeah, and I'd like to give an example on this quote every business is a software business now. What do we mean by that? So, for example, let's take electrical engineering. I, I am an electrical engineer, so it's easier for me to give you this, this example. So, when I was an engineer and we needed to switch from one generator to another, for example, I needed to do it physically, manually. So it means I needed to leave our building and go to the field with electrical equipment to follow the procedure, to take gloves, to take the toolbox. It was very complicated because safety is everything. We worked on the very high voltage, so one mistakes and uh, 
you're done literally on that field. So you needed to go through all of this physically and then come back safe and alive and making sure that the equipment is safe as well. Nowadays, the operators just press the button on their table or on their desk and it operates electronically by the software. So that's how software was integrated into the engineering field. And the same with banking. Before when we thought about bank, it was like a building with lots of money where everything was flowing like manually. And nowadays, again, we have online banking. You don't have to go to the bank to operate or like to do any procedures. So any field we touch has a software department. So Whatever business we are talking about at the end is a software business. I couldn't agree more because I have visited my bank probably three times in the last three years. So that average around once a year. If I if I go back few few years back, uh, I would probably visit my bank a couple of times uh, in a month. And another other ex uh, another example like how things are changing. Uh, like you all have hydro connections, water connections, uh, energy connections at your places, right? Uh, even a couple of years back, person would come manually, do the checking, do the reading, feed into the system, and your bills can generate it. What is happening now? And this is uh, suddenly happening in uh, some areas, if not all. The guy simply drives around your neighborhood and your readings get updated in the system and boom next day your billing is done so now that that optimization has happened like your billing is accurate you are getting it done earlier for a couple of months you will receive an average bill and then actual reading will happen probably once in quarter now every month you can have actual billing and bill your clients correctly get your revenues correctly things are changing a lot of things are changing all right, let's and then stop Brian. Let's keep moving. Yeah, and since we are over 30 minutes, let's keep moving to the scariest slide. What people are <laughs> yeah, we, we already talked about the, this. So, this is the slide you probably all want to have a deeper understanding on. So, I'm gonna take it away and I will pitch in. Yes, so on this slide, we are going to talk about business agility, and we see that business agility basically is structured under the organizational agility, lean portfolio management, enterprise solution delivery, agile product delivery, team and technical agility, and continuous lean culture. So under organizational agility, we have enterprise and uh, government, uh, which is uh, aligning to strategic themes and then to the uh, portfolio vision. And under the lean portfolio management, enterprise solution delivery, agile product delivery team, and technical agility and continuous lean and culture, we have epic owners, enterprise architect, the circle of uh, a solution architect and engineers, solution management, and business owners also system architect engineer and product management uh, rte uh, agile teams product owners scrum master and business technology so lots of words lots of jargon but uh, this basically means the roles of people involved under the uh, business <clears throat> So one thing which I would like to add, as you can see uh, here on the left, right, you will see there are six of these, and we say there are seven core competencies in SAFE. Where is the seventh one? The seventh one is lying right here at the bottom, at the foundation. But without this, we cannot really enable any of this. All of this is, we can enable only when we have the leadership and leadership's mindset in place. When leadership is supportive of the change, when leadership is courageous enough to give time people to fail, learn, and transform. Because failure is one of the key aspects of learning. Now, when we say failure does not mean that you have to wait for failure for long, the whole intent here is pick an experiment, fail fast, move along with your learning, and start implementing 
And that's where the continuous learning culture and team and technical agility is coming to the play. And if you see typical, most typical implementation of SAFE it starts with this block only, which is called essential SAFE where you will have teams of teams coming together, your client centricity will be there. You are not really talking about these things when you are starting your agility. You are, you are going to overwhelm people and a lot of misinformation could be created based on different layers in the organizations. Hence, you always pick and choose how you want to go about it and say if you want to, so you certainly want to have your essentials in place in the organization and then pick one of these, one of three to begin with, whether you want to go with the enterprise level solution delivery or you want to create a portfolio that you can manage collectively or you want to go for this. So this one is kind of a nirvana state where you have everything coming together. And this is exactly a, a roadmap that you have to follow. And we will talk about that roadmap as, uh, as you can see here in the uh, bottom here, implementation roadmap that goes through the multiple states. And it's typically a cycle of 18 to 24 months from starting your journey on SNCL and truly transform the organization to get into a state where you are becoming business agile. Yeah, and I also want to add to this, we also need vision, roadmap, milestones, shared services, UP, system teams, lean UX and metrics to do that. Without vision, roadmap and milestones, we can't move further because if we don't have a vision, what, what are we going to transform? Like what is the purpose of this transformation? What are we going to deliver? And then roadmap. So, okay, we have a vision. The vision is where we are going, but we need a navigator. We need to know how to get there and roadmap will be helpful for us, but we also can't move without the pit stops. So we need to create milestones and the pit stops to get to our North Star and where we want. And metrics, it's kind of our GPS, our navigator. How are we moving to the right direction? Like how many kilometers we've moved during the day? So how are we going to track it? And why I pay attention on that? I was like so passionate about agile people communication so like when i just started coaching i was kind of like neglected to metrics and thought that they're not important but no when i drive i need to know how many kilometers i moved otherwise how would i know how far i'm from my destination that's why metrics are also pictured here and system teams and lean ux and cop and shared services all of these are helping us to get to our north star so, so one question, uh, in the essential part, does the people training come in? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Is there somewhere on this picture or it's like assumed? Yeah, it, it's part of the roadmap we will, we will be showing. Okay. So suddenly it starts with like whoever we want to transform. For example, let's say there is a big organization and we want to transform one business unit of it. Everyone has to be trained. Mm -hmm. First, okay. the leadership has to be trained and leadership has to have the right mindset. And then all people who are related to the transformation or are going to be part of the transformation also should be trained. And there are different role-based trainings also uh, that are there. Thank you. All right. Okay, so let's move further. So maybe let's stop any questions on that because it was a very heavy slide. Okay, let's take questions. Yes, good point, Aina. No, okay, yes. Oh. <laughs> right. no, I mean, I don't have any questions we, we because all, we already what you overwhelmed people. <laughs> yeah, now what, what you're showing is from my perspective, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll circle back with you, Dinesh and Aina, because uh, there's some background of me which I haven't shared here, but this is very familiar. I lived this in my past life, yeah, but differently. We didn't call it safe. We didn't call it agile, but there's something very familiar here. But I don't have any questions, but we will connect separately. Uh, sounds good. Sounds good, Tom. Yeah, happy to connect. All right. So now a little bit, uh, a little bit of uh, marketing for scaled agile as uh, this is something which uh, uh, we, we are doing as part of uh, 
education series or promoting skill as a series. So they certainly have some numbers in there. So Aina, do you want to drive us through this? Yeah, let's go to numbers. All right, so we see that the safe at a glance, we have 700,000 safe trained professionals in 110 plus countries, which is a huge number, and 20,000 safe enterprises across every industry from healthcare to aerospace are using safe, and 400 scale agile partners in 50 plus countries. So these numbers actually tell us how huge the world is involved into transformation and uh, how heavily people utilize safe and why they utilize safe. Again, as I mentioned previously, the organizations are huge. They've been in the market for a while. So it's much easier for startups to transform when they have less people like up to 50 or like 150 people. It's much easier to restructure, to organize compared to organizations who've been in the market for 100 plus years and having departments in different countries and the different cities. So being flexible and agile is way harder for, them and for the startups. And that's why SAFE recommends the scaled framework, which is utilized for, like as I mentioned already, 20,000 plus SAFE enterprises and 700,000 SAFE trained professionals globally. So if you consider, if you want to go SAFE or if you need the uh, certificate, just look at these numbers and try it out. So the prediction is it won't disappear suddenly from the market. It will keep growing. And also some case studies show the results such as 50% of faster time to market when people started using SAFE, 35% increase in productivity, which most uh, enterprises care about, 50% of improvements in quality, and 30% increased employee engagement. And by the way, when we ask questions, what do you think organizations are care about? And it's whether like during the webinars or like uh, when we coach leadership, it's very rare when I hear that someone is uh, cautious about quality, but as a bonus, we have 50% improvements in quality by using SAFE. So, Primary purpose for the transformation is the business agility, uh, digital transformation, and uh, scale agile practices. And we have pledge of 1% do all the good you can and scale agile stock equity and employee time to pledge 1% of campaigns. So these are impressive numbers. Dinesh, do you have anything to add? Yeah, and just, just to reiterate, these are the non, no, not the numbers created by Scaled Agile, but these are the numbers reported by these 400, I scaled, sorry, uh, 20,000 organizations across the globe working with 400 Scaled Agile partners. So this is all real data, and we have a lot of customer stories uh, that come from market clients uh, or market organization that has adopted the uh, uh, safe and I was fortunate enough to work with uh, the organization uh, that is uh, basically listed here and that is the, oh, what is happening here? Sorry, this is just moving upwards. I'm just, okay, I need to pick, yeah. So I started my journey with Capital One. I was, I was, with them when they were starting their journey of agility back in 2006, seven days, and those were my first plus with agility. So, and they, they have been one of the biggest banking organization across the world to adopt to Scrum, Agile, Kanban, and then to Scaled Agile. And they were the ones who were bringing like those big room planning, bringing all people from all over the place who were all part of the team to win big one room. Uh, they had people, 300, 350 people flying from different locations to be co-located and plan for the quarter. So suddenly has gone a long way and they are the really the torch bearers in terms of the banking industry. If you see Capital One leads the way in adoption of agility and technology and a lot of innovation that they do. 
Yeah, actually the same for me. I, I did work with them uh, directly, but when I started, Capital One was one of our partners as well as AstraZeneca. So I had a flavor like few, like 10 years ago on how they work and how they structure. And I actually got my first introduction to sales through to these two companies. Understand. All right. And now it's time for to talk about seven core competencies of business agility as we shown on the big picture also. And we can see this is how those are all are laid out. We can see the lean as a leadership at the bottom of the foundation. And three essential or mandatory ones are on the left side human technical agility, delivery, agile product delivery, and enterprise solution delivery. And then we can layer these things along with that. So, continuous learning culture, organizational agility, and lean portfolio management. Now, next few slides are basically going to be getting into the deeper details of these. Uh, which I believe you wouldn't have time, so would we'll skip quite a few slides and you take your time at your leisure time and read through it. We are going to be sharing all of this with you. And all of this is getting into details of these core competencies. I just want to get to uh, the different configurations of uh, the safe so that we can we can have more conversation on that and understand how this whole roadmap works. The question from you also asked about uh, how this whole thing works. As you can see, uh, we could be uh, waterfall or we could be ad hoc agile as well. Uh, when we are starting, it's, uh, ad hoc agile means you have some teams working in Scrum, some teams working Kanban, or some teams working with some tools or some Scrum band or whatever, but no structured organizational wide adoption of agility is there. And from there on, you, you do the assessment. And this is where, if you are not a government organization, that's where you start with you. You have your tipping points, leadership wants to have changed. Then leadership gets trained, trained on leading safe. Uh, and they, they understand the whole aspect of how this is all going to be laid out and how this is going to be working. And then you start working on training that your change agents then in addition to your leadership. And then you train your managers, executives, and leaders, and then you train everyone basically. And you, you train everyone by this point, and then you create your implementation plan, and then you go into various role specific trainings. This would be Leading safe for the leaders, product owner, product manager for our product owners and manager. Oh, product managers, okay, by the way, product managers <laughs> are the ones. So that is, there is some confusion about what does product manager mean, what does product owner mean. So these are kind of a two in a box kind of scenario. And this could be one person also, and this could be a team of people who is doing the product management. Uh, product owner is one which is inward looking or working with the team day in, day out, and product manager role is basically outward touch point, dealing with the stakeholders, dealing with the customer feedback and getting all those new ideas, innovation come together while product owner part of the role operationalizes that feedback and creates that value so that they are always in sync. They are kind of two in a box. If there are two individuals, if there is one person, then that persons have 50, 50 or 0, 70, 30, whatever is split they want to uh, or they can manage. Uh, it could be one person, it could be people, uh, multiple people in the team doing the product management. So, so the next one, so you said product manager is more outward looking and owner is inward looking? Correct, yeah. Okay. Owner is the, the one who is working with the team to clarifying the requirements that has come in, prioritizing those requirements and getting those created and value to be ready to be delivered. Management mm -hmm. role is getting in feelers from the market, getting the pain points, looking into the heat map, looking into the requirements and translating those. And so they work hand in hand together. Got it. And then you have a specific course for Scrum Master, Architects, and then say for teams for everyone else as part of the team. Everyone gets trained and then we launch our first Agile release train or as it is called in SAFE or team of teams. And then we go on from there and this whole cycle from 
point A to point B is a journey of anywhere from 12 to 24 months based on organizational openness, growth mindset, ability to adapt, and being being nimble about adoption of the agility. Okay. Any question, guys? Again, we want to pause because that was another heavy slide. So if you see the first time, definitely lots of information on one page. Yeah. So, so one question I'm having, I know you mentioned about training the leadership and then the executives and then going on. So is that a uh, hierarchy or is that uh, flow something that is important or critical? Absolutely, yes, Tom. I would say it is critical to have our uh, leadership having that mindset and uh, understand the language they need to speak with the teams. Because if they do not understand, so I can, I can give you a example from my past experience like we uh, we had executives who said oh no no everybody is going agile we want to go agile and they said okay this part of the team or this area of the team will go agile right and then they started uh, and there was one of the perfect example of failing implementation of anything good so they said okay this team does that and then they said, okay, you are the leaders, you are going to be doing it. Those leaders started doing the right thing. But the layer above, the executive layer, they are questioning to the team, their, their rationale for everything was too waterfall, too fixed mindset. They were looking for mm -hmm. everything uh, in, in terms of, okay, you, you want to create any meaningful change, you come back, report to me this, create this uh, cost benefit analysis for anything and everything you are doing. They did not give them autonomy to drive change. So, mm -hmm. and having that autonomy comes from the leadership. Once leadership understand that they have to give them a little good runway to run through whole nine yards of getting people trained, identification of the value streams, identification of the systems involved in supporting that value streams, identification of teams involved in supporting that ecosystem of tools you have, all that mm -hmm. takes time and without doing that right you try to directly implement and launch your arts and bring teams of teams together it's a recipe of disaster because if, if see change has to be uh, something that is going to stick around and that can stick around only and only when leadership has understood that they are going to bump ahead on the road and be willing to adapt those bumps as an impact of going through uh, for something good, going through that change of uh, pain of change for something good to come out of it. Uh, I always give an example of butterfly, how butterfly transforms, how painful that is when they are in the cocoon and when they are breaking out, but the end result is so beautiful, right? Same. Any transformation is very similar to that. Yeah, and I want to add to this, it's important to make sure that both leadership and teams understand that they are all together, like one team, like united forces in one train. And that's why SAFE recommends these like roles, like for leadership and for teams as well. To make sure that they understand from the beginning, all of us in the same train and all of us pushing this train forward to be the butterfly. Otherwise, I found out like the teams are kind of like fighting with the leadership because leadership would push them with the requests, which don't make sense to the teams because they don't speak similar language and the same mm. leadership, they feel like all oh, the teams don't deliver, they're lazy, they don't want to do it. So they kind of like keep fighting instead of joining together. And that's why we have uh, trainings for like both leadership and teams at the same time to align them together and make sure that the team's role is deliver. The leadership role is not pressure teams and micromanage them to deliver, but remove blockers so they can keep moving and deliver faster. Absolutely. And that micromanagement is manifestation of what we are living in, those rigid structures or rigid organization coming from the managing structures 
So we have to liberate that basically. And once we liberate that, then, then you realize, okay, how things are changing. Uh, one of the example could be uh, like, if you want to implement something in a traditional or fixed mindset, you want to have it to be nailed out to the nth degree and then you want to understand how much it is going to cost all upfront, right? Mm -hmm. Which is never correct. I, I bet it, it is never correct, right? But if leadership has not understood how these teams are going to work, how that lean business case will come into the play uh, and how that lean business case will help even leadership to have visibility without getting into necessarily in, in nth degree of those details which are meaningless in long run. So, so, so I think you guys are touching on interesting points, right? I know we are just about almost out of time here. Uh, so essentially, it's a top-down approach. Uh, that's what you're telling me, which is which is not surprising, right? But I think you touched on the on the you know, people wanting value right away, right? Now we will. But my more question is now. I know we are talking about this. I mean, how much does a culture, like a cultural concept? Right, because I come, I, I used to live in India 25, 30 years ago. I have a mindset. I, I think a certain way, right? How much does that thought process have on adapting these things? Do you think there is an, a, a, a relation? <laughs> Certainly, yeah. Cultural backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds have difference, but then each organization has its own culture. Right. right. And, and that culture is what where you have to make dents to make change and really sticky transformation. Mm -hmm. That's where uh, it, it's, it's top down. Uh, certainly it is heavily top down to begin with, but it has to be a very healthy mix of top down and bottom up. If, if we are only focusing on top, not focusing on the bottom, which is like worker bees, then they will be on a different paradigms. And again, mm -hmm. the recipe for disaster, right? So bringing them together on the same level and having the same language and also having that mindset of one for all, all for one, as I mentioned, like we are either sinking or swimming together. There is no other way around. And, and for that to happen, someone in the leadership team has to be courageous enough to put their line on the neck. Uh, sorry, neck on the line. I won't do it. Same difference. On. So they, they have to put their neck on the line to make a transformation really successful. It's not without someone risking their own reputation, their own credibility in the organization that they could catapult into a different lane. Sure. Weak leadership will make for weaker transition, weaker transformation, and ultimately failed experiment. Strong leadership will lead to a better outcome. Agreed. No, that's good. No, thank you. But I'm, I'm sure I have a bunch, bunch of questions, but maybe we'll save it. Yeah, for... we will certainly be planning for a more uh, Q&A only. We will not be going into this slides and all. So we will probably plan for that uh, next month itself, Aina. Yes. And get that on our calendar so that we get into deeper dive on this and continue the movement of uh, providing answers to the queries that uh, uh, everyone on this call has shared. Uh, in, and I have seen so many, my LinkedIn has been buzzing for the past few minutes. So. All right. so, so would you be sharing your contact email or something anywhere here or no? Of okay. course, you do. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. It's been set up somehow, but I will be coming back here again. Yeah, and since it's a LinkedIn event, I think that most of you joined us uh, finding it's on LinkedIn, so there are our contacts on LinkedIn. Feel free to add us and drop us a message. And also, I will share the recording with all people who subscribed to this event. And then when I will schedule the future event for the Q&A, so I will post the video for those who couldn't attend this session, so they would be aware of what happened today and kind of like the session two for Q&A. So they will be able to prepare to ask us questions. And also Dinesh is going to share the a PDF version of the slides. So again, people come prepared to the next one. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you everyone for joining us in and it's staying four minutes over the scheduled time. Really appreciate it. Uh, we should be not only 
preaching, but also following the guidance, following the time boxes. So really appreciate your extra four minutes. Thank you very much. And looking forward to our next session and one-on-one -on -one conversation as the case may be. Thank you. Have a good day ahead and nice weekend. Yes, thank you. Thank you. As the case may be. For participating, for sharing your video and asking us questions and making it more engaging. And Alina was happy to see you. Let's connect offline. And everyone else, Nika, you had a wonderful question on chat. And thank you, everyone else, for participating and um, writing us messages on the chat. And yes, I will share the video with everyone who subscribed to this LinkedIn event. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, uh, Alina. Take care, everyone. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.